So here's my next test. Um, I've got the same sensor, the same strip, basically the same setup, um, except I've, I've now I'm looking at both the anaquad output, which I would consider the coarse grained output, and I'm looking at a sine cosine output, which I'm considering my fine grained output. So if I move the needle one millimeter you get 6.91 and if I move it back 8.47 so it, there's a little calibration that I'm going to need to do um, but so here's 5.9 38-ish. If I go all the way back two millimeters, I get my 8.5 again. So what I've got here is a, I've got a system that repeats that needs calibrating, that's giving me very fine input. It jumps around a little bit, but you can see the resolution is roughly. Uh, two hundredths of a millimeter is about where it's bouncing around and it definitely repeats and I don't really know how fast I can drive it but it looks like I can drive it pretty fast and the code is not at all optimized so if I get right back on zero there we are right right exactly where we are where we were I mean so I think this has a lot of promise to it now I get some weird jumps um, so I think there's some conditions in the code where if I have a negative number it's not doing the right thing um, if I have a negative number on the the course uh, position indicator um, but uh, what I'm gonna do is I'll go ahead and jump into explaining the math behind this and uh, how the signal processing works. Okay, so I'm gonna try to explain how the math works behind the sine, cosine encoder. So just a quick review. Um, what is a sine wave? Well, it, well, it's a wiggling line. And the cosine is 90 degrees out of phase with the first squiggly line. So essentially what we have here in our, in our Hall sensor is one of these channels is going to be the X sensor channel. The other channel is going to be the Z sensor channel. And the frequency is going to change with the speed of the sensor moving over the magnetic strip. Um, so essentially, it's very close to 90 degrees. I haven't actually measured the phase difference. Um, I hope it's 90 degrees out of phase, but it, it, it seems to be close enough to use. And um, so the first way that I'm using it is I'm using this thing called Anaquad. And what Anaquad essentially is doing is it's inverting some of these signals. So now you can see we have three squiggly lines. Uh, so we've got sine, cosine, and the inverse, the inverse of cosine. And so what Anaquad actually does is it looks for values where the sine is greater than the inverse of the cosine. Um, and then it can get more resolution by doing, for example, looking at the cosine relationship to the inverse of the cosine. And it just goes and does a whole bunch of that stuff to figure out when the lines are crossing. Um, so if you look at these points where the lines are crossing, that is interesting to Anaquad. And, and what that essentially tells Anaquad is when the phase changes. So if we just look at these two lines, we can see the blue line is preceding the red line. And that is a representation of the direction of the magnet. So it's going to, the, the sensor is going to see the south pole, the north pole, the south pole, the north pole. And if we invert the signal, and I can just do that here by making a, a negative x, now we can see that the red line precedes the blue line. And that means that we're going in the opposite direction. This is exactly how a quadrature encoder figures out the direction of motion. Um, now, if we do a little bit of trigonometry on those two signals, we can look at the, the inverse tangent or the arc tangent 
of the signal. And so essentially what you see here is you see a line that's going to slope up. Uh, so it's going to have a positive slope. And then when it reaches a certain point, which is essentially an infinity, um, it's going to go ahead and drop straight down. You can, you can think of a line that drops straight down from these two. And in the region between this peak and this valley, there is some hysteresis where the sensor is not really sure what's going on. Um, but essentially, if this is a positive slope, then we know that the phase is that the blue line is preceding the red line. And so I can demonstrate that really quickly by inverting the signal. And now we see the red line precedes the blue line. And now we have a negatively sloped arc tangent line. Now, the other interesting thing that we can do with the arc tangent line is we can take the pole polarity, or I'm sorry, the pole, um, the pole pitch of the magnet. And, and for my magnet, it's roughly two millimeters. I haven't actually measured it yet, um, but it's roughly two millimeters for the refrigerator magnet. And so we take that, we divide it by pi, and we multiply that by this arc tangent. And that should give us another line. And this, this line here in the green line, for example, we'll see is in a range from 1 to minus 1, depending on the direction. So if we flip the direction here, we'll go from minus 1 to 1. And because our pole pitch is in this 2 millimeter range, we can consider this line a displacement of the, uh, of the magnets. So uh, we can use this to actually measure the position of the sensor in between the poles. So what we have is we have a antiquad measurement where we're going to get the, these regions where we can identify the direction. So we're chopping this up and we can see that the direction uh, is a given direction for a coarse chunk of the signal. And then based on that, we can decide um, whether we want, what do we want to do with the fine grain portion of the signal. So the, um, the fine grain portion of the signal is this displacement line. So what we do is we count these, these, these crossing points for the antiquad signal, and that gives us our course position. And then we add the displacement and adding the displacement every time that we, um, so we're going to update that course function so let's say it's one, and then we have a range between uh, we have a, we have a range between zero and two, um, where we can figure out the fine position, and that's that's essentially what I'm doing with the code. So just a quick pseudocode example. There's a bunch of other cruft in my code that doesn't really need reviewing, but uh, the gist of what I'm doing is uh, running through a counter loop, reading the sensor 32 times. Um, that's going to populate an X, Y, and Z value. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and turn that into a uh, assigned value, or I'm going to use a portion of the bit field to make sure that the signed value is correct. And then the next thing I'm going to do is I need to map the signal, which is roughly a range for X between 800 and 8, negative 800 and 800 or 1600. And Z, it's, you know, a little bit less because the Z uh, has a little bit um, less uh, signal. Um, I'm mapping both of those to a range of 0 to 800. That's going to filter out a little bit of noise, not a whole lot. Uh, but then I'm going to go ahead and feed that to Aniquad. I've updated the Aniquad library to accept uh, arguments. And so I'm going to pass it these two values. And that is going to update... Uh, two things. It's going to update a variable called antiquad position, uh, which will tick every time antiquad detects a, a phase change. And it's also going to update a value that's called uh, spin direction, uh, which I can use to figure out which direction the sensor is moving in relation to the, to the magnetic strip. I map this range from a, a negative 1 to 1 so that I get a normalized sine wave. And then the next thing I do is I go ahead and apply the displacement calculation, which is the 2 is the pole pitch here divided by pi times the tangent, the arc tangent of the signal that I uh, normalized up here. And then the next step is I apply a low pass filter uh, with, uh, with a parameter that I can tune the filtering. Uh, then the next step is to uh, normalize the antiquad position. So each, uh, this is an integer, uh, 
and for each tick of the integer, it's about 0 0.0125. I haven't calibrated this. This is where all the accuracy is going to come in, is making sure that this this uh, this multiple here is is accurate based on the actual pull pitch of the refrigerator magnet. Um, this is getting me close enough for the testing, and it does repeat, so um, I can I can tune this later. Um, then I want to go ahead and map uh, the the low pass filtered displacement. Uh, I want to map that to. <clears throat> um, I'm not even sure why I did this. I think I just did this to create a, a little bit of additional filtering. So I'm I'm mapping it from a range of minus two to two. Uh, I'm mapping that uh, from eight to zero and then dividing it by four, which should give me a range from zero to four. Which does again, I don't even know why I did this. I was messing with filtering and it's probably doesn't, isn't something that needs to be fixed. Anyway, so then uh, the final step that I want to do is I want to go ahead and take the anaquad you know, measurement in millimeters and then I want to add the displacement, normalized displacement field. And then I just have a, a print statement that goes ahead and prints that out. And so the next thing we'll look at is what that actually looks like on the serial plotter. So here what I'm showing is with the blue line, zero is direction one, and one is a direction other than one. Um, obviously that's configurable. The uh, red line, the filter displacement, and I think the green line is the unfiltered displacement. So if I, if I, this is a different setup than I had on the, with the ball screw and the linear rail and all those things where I can move, you know, very uh, much in a straight line. This is, I'm literally moving it with my hand. But if I, if I go ahead and move the magnet under the sensor, what you're going to see is you see these lines move up and down. These are our coarse grain lines. And if I move it really quickly, you'll see those transitions where we have some hysteresis. And it's not a perfectly straight up and down transition. But if we have a positively sloped red or green line, then we know we're moving in direction one. If we have a negatively sloped red or green line, we know we're moving in direction two. So you'll see that blue line jumping up and down depending on the direction. Uh, and that is calculated from the antiquad phase calculation. The green and the red lines are calculated from the coarse grain sine cosine arctangent displacement calculation. So the quicker it moves, the, the more straight up and down those lines are. But if I move it really slow, sometimes you get a whole lot of uh, squiggles in there. And those squiggles are essentially the sensor not really being sure uh, where it is. It's called hysteresis. But that is that map that should map directly back to the chart that we were the uh, the graph calculator that we were using. So again, we see this displacement line, which should go ahead and map to. You see some squiggles in there. Oh, I'm getting the sensor off of the magnet. It doesn't like that. But you see a little bit of squiggling in there. I'll try to do a screen capture of that and compare it to the the theoretical. Theoretically, this is a this is you know 90 degrees, very easy to detect. Uh, there's noise and other things that affect that. So that's essentially the math and the signaling. And you know what this sensor is really designed to do is not this. Uh, <laughs> this sensor is designed to measure rotation. And so a lot of this theory applies to measuring rotation with, with a magnetic encoder. Um, when you're measuring rotation with one of these encoders, generally you have a diametrically opposed magnet and the sensor can detect the angle of the magnet to 12 bits, um, plus or minus whatever the accuracy of the sensor is. Um, but it's roughly, you know, divide 360 by you know, let's call it 3,600. So you have about a half a degree accuracy um, in the rotational measurement. And then if you can figure out how much uh, a rotation maps to a given linear displacement, then, then you can map that right back into a linear measurement. This is using the fact that, the, that I can measure both the X and the Z 
And in this particular hall mode for the sensor, they happen to be offset uh, and, and with a strong enough signal that I can determine the displacement from, from, from the offset of the signals. I think another way to do this whole thing is to um, use uh, the rotation aspect of the sensor. And so my next experiment is actually going to be to um, to create a rack and pinion where I can measure the rotation of a gear meshing with a rack. And then from that gear meshing with the rack, I can calculate the linear position, uh, assuming that I can do, do you know, mesh those gears with as little backlash as possible. So that'll be the next experiment that I do, and I want to compare the results to, to this uh, experiment. I'm very, very pleased with this experiment, and I'm actually very surprised at how little information there is on sine, cosine, and coding um, based on you know how good this result actually is. Uh, another way to go about doing this particular type of measurement is to use a high sensitivity hall sensor, or two of them, uh, and to make sure that they're placed, um, you know, in this out of phase relationship, um, and if, and you potentially could get a better signal. Uh, I've actually ordered some tunneling magneto resistive sensors, which are supposed to have uh, a much higher signal compared to uh, hall sensors. The, the the one problem that I see with that is I need an a, a analog to digital converter that will be able to to measure that very quickly. Um, the test that you just saw with the, the serial monitor here, um, this is actually hooked up to a Teensy, and the test that you saw on the bench with the ball screw and the linear rail, that was an ESP32. ESP32 is about half the price of a Teensy. Um, this is a Teensy 3.2. Um, so I, I, you know, it seems like it can do the calculation. I haven't actually timed how long the functions take to ca calculate on the different platforms. Um, theoretically, the Teensy is faster because there's actually a whole library that's optimized for Teensy just for doing the digital signal processing, uh, and it may make a, a, for a much more accurate uh, way to do this particular sine-cosine calculation. But the Teensy is considerably more expensive than the ESP32. And I got that ESP32, by the way, with the screen. I, I think it was about 8 bucks uh, for the processor plus the screen. Um, the other question I have about this is if I want to do multiple uh, axes, I'm not sure how quickly I can read and then actually do all the math. So uh, I have to take, I have to be able to do the uh, the, the the trigonometry calculations, um, you know, three times for every axis. Um, now you may only be moving one axis at a time, so it might not matter that much. Um, but what you really want to make sure doesn't happen is is that you miss a phase transition. Because if you miss a phase transition, then you're gonna, you're gonna, your position is gonna be off. So anyway, I, I again, I thought this was super interesting. It was a really fun experiment for me to do, and I, I didn't see much information on this. I'm gonna go ahead and link a bunch of the papers that I found uh, that helped me understand this better. I still don't really have a very strong grasp of the math, um, but I'm gonna go ahead and link the papers. And I'd love it if people have any ideas on what filters can be applied to this to get a better signal or better ways to process the signal, um, that would be great if you could leave those down below. Anyway, thanks for watching.